I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, a session that's very close to my heart, which is also so topical that it is um, the global conversation, whether it's on your news, whether it's um, at the World Economic Forum across the globe, and very, very central to the conversation that we've been having here at the India Economic Summit. We know uh, how important and key it is to drive women's labor participation for ensuring economic growth. Um, the gender parity, wage gap debate, it's all um, pretty much anyone seems to talk about when we talk about women or mention the word women anywhere on the planet, whether it's at Laguna Beach, whether it's in New York, London, Paris, or here in Delhi. Um, India's numbers, interestingly enough, um, especially of the past decade, seem to have been um, held up as some sort of an anomaly to global trends. Um, it's that head scratcher, to say, to say the least. I mean, everyone brings it up, saying it's got the lowest female participation um, in the workforce, in the, in the, you know, not in the world. We, the WEF numbers uh, are also thrown about a lot in headlines. So 139th ranking out of 145. And then you add a little bit more spice to that and you say, oh my God, um, the only countries behind it are what? Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria. So that really brings you back to the point where someone says, okay, this is a problem, but if you close the gender gap in the workforce by 25%, um, and this is an ILO report that suggested this, you can increase the GDP by a trillion dollars, and if you do it very quickly. Um, all very nice numbers to talk about, and we also talk about societal issues and uh, all the reasons why we're not able to achieve it, uh, which is not anything new to anybody in this room or anyone in the world. Uh, so what do we need to do, truly, to make that growth happen, increase the participation rate, whether it's from government policies or whether it's businesses and the actual uh, policies they implement internally. So we've got a wonderful panel uh, to talk about this. Manisha Garotra is the CEO um, of India, of MOLIS. Uh, Manisha was the former head of UBS in India and worked with the bank across the world and was also prior to that heading up Barclays um, Investment Bank here in India. Al Rajwani is uh, the CEO and Managing Director of Procter & Gamble um, here in India, but you've worked in multiple uh, markets for PNG for, I won't say for how long, because that would just be very rude. <laughs> Um, and I'll just mention some of the countries that he has seen and, and brings this international perspective. U.S., China, Canada, Korea, Pakistan, West Asia, the list just goes on. Um, and his understanding of both developed and developing markets is going to be very useful um, for this conversation. Dipali Goenka needs no introductions, but for our audiences across the world, I will say it. Uh, CEO and Joint Managing Director of Wellspun India. Um, she's driving the growth of this textile business to a billion U.S. dollars globally. It is an amazing achievement. The Pali has also been selected as the member of the Walmart Home Supplier Council, along with some other global leaders. Mr. Amitabh Khan, also a man who needs no introductions here in India, but for our audiences around the globe, he's the author of Branding India, an incredible story. He's been the key driver of um, headlines like Make in India, Startup India, Incredible India, God's Own Country campaigns, and currently is the CEO of Niti Ayog, which is the National Institution for Transforming India, and he was still recently the Secretary of the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotions here in the country. So, I've had my word. I'm going to put it out there to all of you, and maybe we can start with uh, you, Dipali. Um, the question, how can companies and the government work to make sure that 48% of this population not just enters the workforce, but stays and grows. Yeah. Um, you know, thank you. When you, when you talk about the government, we, you talk about uh, the country. I think, first of all, as businesses, what are we doing about it? Can businesses be the agents of change? I think, and that's what we need to talk about and start from there. Uh, we are one of the youngest uh, you know, country in the world, and 50%, and as you rightly said, I mean, women, if they get employed. So uh, for us at Wellspun, I will, I'll just uh, talk about one example which I have is very, very strong. Uh, we did a project with one of the um, biggest retailers in the world where 
the girls were, you know, involved in multi-skilling. And uh, there was this girl called Avni who was chosen out of thousands and thousands of girls who were trained. And she, she moved from, our, uh, you know, she went from Anjar to Arkansas and spoke about mm -hmm. her experience. And that, that was just so powerful. I mean, she couldn't even dream of going out of Anjar to Bombay. And that was something that, that created an aspiration of, for so many girls in that kind of a, a vicinity. Apart from that, I, I just will quote one more small example. So when we talk about textiles and when we talk about uh, you know, manufacturing, uh, you just don't talk about a setup. You talk about communities because it influences the communities around you. Um, so we have these villages whom we work with. We, we, we work with the Smart Village Initiative there. But a, a special mention would be a project that we do is SPUN, where we are vocationally training these women who have actually long, long forgotten the kind of art and craft which, we, which they were doing. So they're vocationally getting trained. They are being, you know, they have the ability now to you know, operate their bank account. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you know about Gujarat, it's ma basically a cotton-grown area. And, uh, you know, children are not allowed to go to school. Yep. So if that woman is earning her own living, her child is definitely going to school. And that is a very <coughs> important story, which I like to talk about all the time, because um, if I talk about uh, at Wellspun, around, um, uh, you know, around 20% women are women, 20% workforce is women, and we have already trained 1,200 women for this initiative uh, at SPUN. It's amazing that she talks about it, and um, don't think I've forgotten our final panelist here, because I wanted to come to you, Priyanshu, and introduce you, because it's, um, it's quite appropriate to bring you in at that point. Priyanshu Singh is a CEO of ADECO, uh, which is an HR solutions company here in India. He's worked globally and is quite appropriate to bring you in at this point because you worked at McKinsey, Honeywell, you've been an army officer, you've seen a range of issues across the board. When you look at it from uh, having worked in the army, now working in HR solutions, and working with both the Indian and the global view, how do you react to what, what the Pali is saying? Is, does that resound with you, with what, what you're seeing in the marketplace? Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction. I mean, on the lighter side, at least, I'm moving in the right direction. I'm moving from organizations that were very low on gender diversity to uh, HR solutions. So from the army to HR has been a big uh, transition, almost zero, to uh, nearly half. So our industry is well poised. Um, what we can, of course, do is, is much more, and uh, of course, as you said, that, um, it, that there are, of course, societal challenges that need to be faced. And we will, of course, do a lot about that in a due course of time. That, that is the biggest bugbear, if you really ask me. And then would be what the corporations can do, because it's a work environment that we create. The government can only be advisory. They can form a policy and let us know that here's what you need to do. A lot of people not even adhering to those. Very recently, uh, the government came up with a good initiative of extending the maternity leave for women to six months. As a business leader, it really hurts. If you look at it from that perspective, a business leader, that, you know, I am having an employee, but I'm paying that employee, but I'm getting nothing out of that employee for half a year. But in the bigger scheme of things, I can retain that employee. I can ensure that the person stays with me. And of course, there's continuity the cost of changing employees that gets eliminated. So one's got to look at a holistic picture. And at the end of the day, this is such an intractable problem, largely because every country that you go to, and in our country, every state, specific district also you go to, the dimensions will change. So, you know, the party's got a fantastic example coming in from Anjar. If you go five districts away, it could be a very different story, and that's how diverse our country is. So, it, it's very specific solutions that we need to go very micro level. The, like, as I said, the government can be overarching, the corporations and the employers. The multinationals might be a little bit more developed on that. From my experience, I see that they are harking towards increasing the participation, ensuring what else can we do to, to ensure that women stay on in the workforce. But as you go down the sectors, down the uh, tier uh, two, three cities, from MNCs to small and medium establishments, the, the attitude changes. So it's inside each one of us that we really need to change. So if you look at it from our industry, there would be certain companies that you know are more uh, favorable towards this, some others aren't. And it is not, you can't really blame the company. Now, I, I moved to HR from industrial sector. Now, industrial sector is massively underrepresented, and it is not for want of trying. 
Frankly, I was leading a business, uh, India's uh, leading uh, infrastructure automation company, and I tried my best to increase the participation. It just won't happen. Some women would show up and say, oh, I thought it was an IT job. You wanted to go to construction sites, can't do. Fair enough. So there are certain challenges that we do have, but, and there are certain sectors that are mired in it. But there are certain that can get out of it. And then, of course, if you have the leadership, like what probably Deepali is providing, and maybe um, uh, you know, the other uh, senior ladies who provide, it can be done. Al, it's have you found done. that? When you look at it, a PNG's approach to situations here in, in India, is it, is it very different to the diversity and inclusion packages that you've put in place around the world? You've won awards for it globally. Um, is there a difference? I think what's similar is the core principles are the same. So Pro Procter & Gamble, diversity and inclusion is a core principle. Why? It's the right thing to do, and it's good for business. Mm -hmm. And if you have any doubt about that, you can't succeed. So it is the right thing to do. All of us agree. It's good for the country. GDP goes up, right? It's good for societies. It's good for families, income increases. But it's good for business. And not just because some productivity number increases, is because a diverse team delivers better results. The data is out there. US companies that have women on their board perform better, okay? Now, it starts with the commitment. So let me just talk a few examples, right? You want me to do a global thing. A little bit of credibility first, right? So we have 40,000 women. 43% of our management globally are women. One third of our senior management are women. By the way, this is a big change. Was when I started with the company 36 years ago. When you looked at the annual report 36 years ago, it was all men wearing blue or gray suits and red ties. <laughs> Today it's like a United Nations, and one third of them are women. One third of our board are women. Okay? In India, 50% of the workforce is women. 30% overall is women. 40% of my leadership team is women, right? Now let me tell you three examples of where, if you're committed, you can make things happen, right? So 2003, I moved to Saudi Arabia. That time, there was no women working at Procter & Gamble in Saudi Arabia. After a lot of work, we got licenses number one to hire females in Saudi Arabia. This is one of my proudest accomplishments. Every time we have a management visit, I show them these licenses. It's in Arabic, but it says number one, <laughs> right? Today, 15% of our workforce in Saudi Arabia are women, right? When I worked in Korea in 2000 to 2003, it was a very male-dominated culture. I worked with two young ladies who were product managers at the time, S. Kelly and Juyon Kim. The last two managing directors in Korea have both have been women, and these two women. Juyon Kim is the current managing director of Korea, right? One coming closer to home. We built a plant in Hyderabad four or five years ago. We decided that 30% of the workforce would be women. At the time, there was a law in Hyderabad that women could not work the night shift. Yeah. We worked with the government to change it. We started with 30%, and we've now increased on it. Right? So when corporates are committed, governments are supportive. And I can tell you today, with the likes of Mr. Amitabh Khan, and I'm not just saying it because he's here. Are you sure? I'm sure. <laughs> and with the right Gujaratis in power, because I'm a Gujarati, <laughs> right? With Prime Minister Modi, with the commitment you have, Corporates feel like you have a partner you can partner with to make a step change in this area, right? Which is very different, very different. So I think it's all about intention on both sides. And once the intention is there, the commitment is there, you'll find a way. Amitabh, this is the question that then comes up. Is this a checkbox mentality for the government that we have these statistics, uh, it's not great for international reputations when you are considered an anomaly to global trends for women's participation in the workplace? Um, and do government policies then have to drive it? Or are you the foundation, the support? And how do you support corporates, um, not just with you know, programs in the villages, but across the board? How do you view, view the way this particular administration is handling um, the participation of women, especially what's happening in the last 10 years? Uh, you know, firstly, uh, women contribute uh, just 24% of India's GDP. The worldwide average is close to about 48%. So India needs a very conscious policy of gender parity. Uh, if you look at this government, it's focused very heavily on a program called Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao. Save the girl child and educate her. Uh, 
you know the challenge is a huge challenge it's a challenge of education it's a challenge of infant mortality it's a challenge of maternal mortality it's a challenge of nutrition uh, these are vast challenges and the challenges uh, you know because india is a very large country we must understand the dimension of it it's bigger than 24 countries of europe so the southern part of India does well, the western part of India does well, the eastern part of India does very badly. So you need to dramatically change the picture in seven states of India and about a hundred districts of India. And I think there's a huge emphasis being laid on this in terms of education, in terms of nutrition. And I think this will make a, a huge, huge dent simply because there's a real conscious attempt at focusing on the girls, I mean in terms of providing them cycles to go to schools, etc. But in the last few years, I've seen an overwhelming change. I mean every single opportunity that girls have been opened up to, they've outperformed boys. Every single competitive exam that has been opened up, whether it was medicine, whether it is... But the numbers birth, are still dropping. Huh? But the numbers yeah, of yeah, participation you know, are still it's dropping. A, in some areas, it's a historical issue. It'll take time. I mean, don't expect quick results. Mm -hmm. But over the next five to six years, you'll see dramatic... I mean, look at my college. When I went to college, it was an all-males bastion. Uh, last year, when I went to the same college, on merit, 92% in that economics honors of St. Stephen's College, 92% of the students were all girls on merit. And the... The principal said that if you want the college to remain co-ed, you have to give 10% extra marks to boys. You know, I, so I was quite surprised, it became a controversy, but when I went to uh, Christ College in Bangalore, I saw only girls all over, everywhere. So I asked the vice chancellor there, the, the only girls here, he said, no, it's a co-educational college. Despite the fact, you know, and there were hardly any boys, he says, we give 15% extra marks to boys. Despite that, they don't get in because the girls are just out, uh, outperforming boys. I mean, look at the startup movement in India. I mean, there's one young girl, Pranshu Bhandari. Uh, look at, she started an app called Hello English. She's taught 9 million Indians, 9 million Indians through an app called Hello English, how to speak English in one year. Not a single school, not a single college has been able to do it in India. Look at a person like Meena Ganesh. She runs Portia which puts old people, people suffering from different ailments in touch with doctors, etc. She's supported almost 25,000 patients, provided jobs to about 15,000 people. I mean, amazing amount of work is happening in the field. But this seems, Manisha, to be a situation where and there's another anomaly in India that you've just brought up, that in the financial services, in the STEM industries, uh, where in Europe we struggle to get women into the financial services, it's a constant complaint, we have uh, programs upon programs uh, in the UK or across Europe where we try and get women into STEM. Here, it's the opposite. So education, is that the key? Because there's also a, a counter argument saying if a, if a family is making more money, the woman doesn't have to go to work. I mean, where do you see it as in your industry and when you look at technology as well? Sure, I think, you know, uh, education, of course, is a key part, Maitri, there's no question about it. But I think also 25 years ago when I set up, it was the opportunity. If you look at the domestic institutions such as ICIC, et cetera, the client base became more women-centric and hence it was good economics, as was mentioned earlier by Al, to have women in, in the business. Global firms came into this business, you know, the glo and brought global practices of maternity leaves, paternity leaves, you know, work out of home, etc., which was which was very unique to financial services. I don't think manufacturing ever could have thought of such things. You know, five day week, week six uh, manufacturing thought six days, and if you could pull out the Sunday, it'll be great too. So I think I think all of that really helped the women. Having said that, I mean, financial services has its own struggle. Other than the top 15, 20 women you see, we still struggle to retain women. We get a lot of women gender neutral in hiring, so you, know, you start off, it's great. But I think, you know, to Amitabh's point, it's the patriarchal feudal mindset. Just as soon as you become, your incomes get to a comfortable level, the woman just drops out. You know, the, the mindset is the woman is the home, get, home taker, right? So I think as a result of that, we still struggle in financial services, and that's really the challenge on how do you make work out of home, five day a week, Adi Godrej is in the, in the audience, and Adi was saying to me the other day that, you know, they reskill, they've reskilled women in villages, right, Adi, and basically run hair salons out of home. So a lot of that needs to be done, and, you know, that culture and mindset needs to change in India because we are very much like, you must come to work six day a week. I think government was one of the few early ones to have five yeah, day a week. Yeah. And I think in the IS community and state-owned banks, you see a lot more women than you see in uh, 
private sector. So a lot of mindset needs to change, and also in financial services. And that's why you need the whole, to your point, you need that public and private partnership. You know, it's, it's the situation is so bad that you need to change mindsets at home. You need to, you know, c create so much ownership for a woman's job, pride in a woman's job. We, for example, celebrate women's success by taking their families out, celebrating their success with the mother-in-law, father-in-law, mom. And, you know, that builds pride. So I think a lot more needs to be done. We're just at the tipping point. But I agree with Amitabh. The girls are way smarter than the guys in all our organizations. They'll have men for breakfast. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with that <laughs> in any which way. I'd like to open this up to the audience, um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts, or your questions for, uh, for our panel. Do introduce yourself and um, also um, who you're addressing your question to and make it quite short because I'd like to squeeze as much as I can out of the session. Anybody? Oh, there's a question right there. Hi. Oh, I'm going to stand up. Uh, I'm Sandhya, and I'm from the ADECO group with Priyanshu, and I just wanted to direct a question to the two female leaders here. Um, it's, it's really lovely to see that a lot of women are taking leadership roles, but something that I've noticed and I think we need to focus on is we don't have role models in middle management and senior management. Uh, it's great to look in the newspapers and TVs and find people at the CEO level, even, even though the percentage of that is really less. How do, we, how do we encourage women to take those roles, those management roles, which would get them to that CEO level and not drop out after they've gotten to that income level and they're satisfied? Uh, because if I want to look at the top people in my organizations, they're still mostly men, and they're not mm -hmm. enough country managers in a global perspective who are women. Nepal, so, you want to take that? Yeah. You know, um, that's a very interesting question. And, uh, you know, when you're even talking about middle management, I think for us, at, uh, you know, in manufacturing, it also starts from the grassroots level. I mean, uh, so even, I mean, for me, I'll start off and I'll take this question from the grassroots and then take it to the middle management. First of all, I mean, I have girls coming in from all over the country to work at Wellspun in Gujarat. We have a girls' hostel. Um, and uh, we have around 500 girls. So we give them free lunch and dinner. But you know, it's a subsidized breakfast. There were girls who were saving that 10 rupees so they could save that and send that home. And it was something that just touched me because, you know, when I go and just talk to them, it was something which I felt that, so, you know, uh, the, the thing that I would take on from here is that how can, you know, organizations like us look at and understand the needs, what are needed. So we, we basically uh, looked at not only taking away that subsidy, but also educating them online, giving them, uh, you know, uh, opportunities to graduate and take on leadership positions. Um, giving on positions where we can, you know, um, when, I, uh, when I talk about Wellspun, I will take an example at Wellspun, not about, you know, when you talk about middle management, do we have people who could mentor them and guide them? Do we have policies which could have, and when we talked about the maternity policy of those six months, can we, can we have that kind of an opportunity for them that, yes, you can work from home, we, we will embrace you back into, uh, into a workplace. I think and that's what needs to be done. Otherwise, they'll be completely discouraged. And as I said earlier, I mean, there were these, uh, uh, you know, there, there are these various programs where, where you know, um, if we can have them, uh, you know, have an opportunity to multi-skill and hence also have opportunity where they can be mentored by the, uh, by the seniors, that could really help them. I mean, that's where I would leave it. Amitabh, the question then is when, when you look at government policies, um, how could that be complementary? Because uh, maternity leave, paternity leave, it's a, big, it's a big issue even in the European Union. I mean, we, we have a tough time getting this through um, 27 countries. I'm being correct, politically correct about this now thanks to Brexit. But how do you, as a government, then support that company from making all the choices it has to because it does affect top and bottom line? So government itself, you know, government has to be the key catalyst, according to me. And the government itself and the government as an organization, which makes a vast difference, has pursued a very, very uh, broad-minded policy of maternity leave. And hopefully every single corporate will pursue that. And I, I see great signs of this, you know. I mean, I was recently, I'd visited the uh, JCB uh, plant, which is a hardcore manufacturing plant. I mean, it manufactures all the construction material. 
uh, I went to their tool room and all the tool room mechanics were all girls from local villages, all girls. And they said they were the finest tool room mechanics, better than the boys there. I mean, you, you go to Cummins, uh, they've, you, they've, done, they've created a whole engineering college for girls. But that's again corporates so, so, putting so, the rules so, in yeah, place. So I'm just asking now about on the, government policy. On the policy. government side, I think what the government has done is to really focus on key things. Because the dropout levels of girls at a young age was very high. The key thing is make education a very exciting venture for young girls. It, it ensure that they keep coming back to the education. And I think there's a whole focus on several states of India. I mean, it, states which have done well have, I mean, look at a state like Kerala, which in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, physical quality of life index has been the number one state in India. It's simply because every single woman is 100% educated. Every single woman works. And therefore, that's the lesson for each one of the other states of India. And I think the key focus has to be, to my mind, the lesson, the focus for India has to be nutrition, because there's an intergeneration cycle of lack of nutrition. The focus has to be on inf infant mortality and maternal mortality. And the focus has to be to ensure that the girls go through education yes. and get into. That is really the crux of it all. If you've cracked that, and that's where the government plays a role. If you've cracked that, then the rest of it follows. Al, you had something to say. Yeah, I want to build on the, on the government part. You know, so we are in the feminine care business. And what happens is a lot of girls drop out when they hit menstruation, right? And you know, we educate four and a half million girls yearly on menstrual health. And what I've seen recently with the government's you know, girl-child policy, a lot of chief ministers are becoming interested in how do we extend this to government schools, right? So what do we need? We go in and we take one teacher per school and make her the expert on menstrual health. Then we go in with our programs, showing the girls how to use the pads because their mothers did not, right? Also we found it's very important to have toilets, girl toilets in the schools. And that's why the government's initiative on toilets is right on. Because if you have the right pad, but if you don't have a toilet, the girls will not go to school. And if they start missing a week of school, pretty soon they fall behind, then they drop out, right? This is where I think a good example of partnering you know, between government and, and, uh, and, and corporates, right? Now, one thing I would add also, you know, I think it's great to have female role models. I think it's great to create networks for support. We've tried mentoring at a regional and global level where our female leaders, okay, but this doesn't take away the responsibility of the male managers. As the managing director of Procter & Gamble, I have to do succession planning for my lead team. I get to choose who those people are, including my own replacement. And it is my job, my responsibility, to make sure that women are well represented there. So right? do we need men heroes at the workplace, uh, your frontline managers, your... Uh, male board members, your uh, immediate supervisor. Is that what we're targeting, the hero dad, the, the hero manager? Is, is that the cultural mindset that we need to take, that I, he I takes it in the, in the workplace and then takes it home? I don't know if it's agricultural mindset, but it is, without it, it will not work. Right? So if you're a company that has no women, how are you going to jumpstart it? Because again, getting the women in is half the job. Retaining them is very important, right? So how are you going to create the support system? How do you tell men how they're going to behave in a supportive way? How are you going to tell them that you're going to have zero tolerance for sexual harassment, right? Because this is what women are worried about, right? Security, harassment, right? This is our job as leaders, right? And then once you get the virtual cycle going, the women create the networks and the support, and we can tap into the regional, global. I think we can go into other companies for mentorship, right? But that doesn't take away my responsibility, right? Because this is absolutely critical. If I believe it's the right thing to do and right for business, just like any business strategy, I'm committed to it, I will execute with excellence, right? I think it starts with this, my three. Without this, I think you will not make progress. Manisha, have you found that uh, as, as, a, as a woman CEO, that you, uh, you have to empower the men in your, in, in, in your organization to be the heroes for the women who are under them? Because we are missing that middle of um, you know, women leaders in middle management. So do you have to go out and give them that empowerment message to say, 
you have to be the hero for people under you? Completely. I mean, there is no question that you have to have the men in the organization take ownership for the success of the women. You drill down onto the men that, you know, this is good economics, this is good for the organization, diversity is good at the board level, at the management level. Our clients, for example, PNG may be a client, is somebody who caters a lot to women. I can't just send a male team. I mean, I won't think very highly of me if I just send a male team to pitch my business to him. So, you know, drill down into the men, make them the heroes, make them retain the women. Uh, don't form boys club at lunch tables, etc. You know, don't just, the minute the girl walks in, stop talking and, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you just make, integrate the woman and make her feel part of the team. I think it's one of the key things that all women say to me when they quit that, you know, that they feel that there's a big boys club, even in investment banks. And I think that's really very important to drill down into the men who at home are told they are the best thing in the world and, you know, the woman is uh, not nowhere close. When they come to yeah. work, they have to shed that mindset. And one of the other things I just wanted to comment on was what, you know, Amitabh said, government really has to do a lot more. And I, one of the key areas I believe they have to do a lot more is in the security itself and social security. You know, a lot of girls and women, young women, quit because they just don't feel safe going home in the night. And it doesn't matter that we organizations provide cars and buses, etc. They just, I think given what's happening in the country, that's a big cause for women uh, leaving. Because, you know, investment banks tend to work 20 hour days. We, during crunch times, we work midnight, 4 a.m. And you cannot let the girls in the organization go earlier because that's exactly where the whole, you know, the whole purpose fails. So, I think that's somewhere we, where we really need more help from the government just in terms of, and yeah. a lot of it is mindset change, but you know, a lot more, a stronger system yeah. to, for security is important. I mean, that's an issue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is Infrastructure? No, no. Uh, I, I think one of the key things the government is doing is uh, ensure that every single benefit of the government, whether it's houses, affordable housing, whether it's direct benefit transfer, whether it's scholarship, everything goes in the name, in the account of the mother. That's a very big catalytic change. I entirely agree with Manisha that safety and security is a key issue. And it's very incumbent upon municipal governments, governments and the state governments to ensure that if there's 100% safety and security, you want. one bad incident, it has a huge demonstration impact and therefore it's very, very important that this is done. Uh, but you know, I mean, across the board, if you look at governments, uh, there's a huge, huge policy shift in favor of women. I mean, look at the number of self-help groups we've constituted. Uh, the number of women in rural areas who today got jobs because of the self-help groups, and they've, they've really been the catalyst of creating great economic activity. 30 million self-help groups in this country. I mean, it's a unique case study of how women have lifted households above the poverty line. I mean, the Western world doesn't talk about it. The Western world doesn't know about it. But women in states after states, Kerala, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, are responsible for lifting households above poverty line simply because they formed cohesive self-help groups and created an economic activity. But, uh, you know, for many years, I worked in the traditional fishery sector of Kerala. That sector was totally transformed by fisher women who took fish from uh, the beach level, took it to the colonies and sold them, but we, we created as government, we created fisherwomen buses. And they ensured that the fishermen, they knocked out 17, 18 levels of middlemen. They ensured that the returns to fishermen goes up from 10, 15% to about 85, 90%. It's all the role of traditional fisherwomen. Therefore, self-help groups, traditional fisherwomen across the country have made a radical difference to the lives of women. And these are untalked of stories. Is that, is that something we can take away, that the West is missing a critical element of learning that we can get from things that are happening in, in India, where the sad story is heard, but we don't hear of the small successes that could be the life lessons? I would say there are these small successes that are there which, which could really uh, be big stories uh, for the Western world because I think when we work in India, it is from the bottom of the pyramid. I mean, uh, today, um, when you're talking about even uh, sexual harassment or se social security, I mean, I'm just going to take that uh, time to just say that. But have we also done and taken time to have our blue-collared workers also have training? We have training and skill development. Have we thought about even training them about respect for the women or they're working with their uh, other colleague uh, have you done that I think that's very very important that we take that forward secondly I think as as companies as I mean I would say at Wellspun we've just as you're talking about Kerala and Andhra Pradesh and self-help groups uh, 
We just set up an exclusive cut and sew unit, and it just started a week back, run by women exclusively. The security guard is a woman, the driver is a woman. So I think if you give them that empowerment and a feeling, I think even when you talk about social security, I think let them take care of themselves. I think that is very, very important. I think we had a question from the back. If we can get a mic um, to the back, please. Hi, my name is Utkarsh. I'm a global shaper from the New Delhi Hub. Uh, I'm curious to learn how the platform economy or the gig economy will further empower or disempower women. Because they're self-defined hours and the future of jobs might mean that people can define what jobs they want to take. They can be micro-entrepreneurs. So I'm curious to see what that will lead to. And the second part, if there's time, I'd love to hear ideas of ways to uh, overcome unconscious bias, which actually exists in many circles that uh, don't know that there are. So, Priyanshu, uh, do you want to take the first part? How does the gig economy change the situation? All right, so the, in, in my view, the, the, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about how uh, there have been differences or uh, gaps in the opportunities that, uh, that a boy or a girl had, uh, basis their socioeconomic uh, divide or where they came from, what education they got, and then Mr. Kant also talked about the infant mortality and female mortality, etc., in terms of birth. What the gig economy will try to do is eliminate a lot of those gaps. Because as we've talked, if you look at the educational systems, etc., the girls are kind of outperforming the boys. Since I was in school, I've been seeing that happen. But after you go a little bit, then the flexibility or the inflexibility of the workforce starts hitting. And then the new economy gives you a lot of flexibility to work the way you want. So we'll eliminate a lot of those traditional obstacles or bottlenecks that uh, the women experience, and I would think that should be a good one. In fact, Mr. Khan's examples of what women are doing in terms of empowering others are pretty cool on, uh, on that front. The only gap that we have is a lot of these stories that we have from India, when they go westwards, they are more feel-good stories than learning a lesson stories. Because the problems that we have here, as uh, Mr. Khan very correctly brought up, are just so basic that when, when a European mind starts solving for them, they don't even understand that the government of India or the people here have to start at the very foundations where Europe was probably 100 years back, or maybe never. You never know. So we need to have some great stories, which are lessons learned that we can actually export from here. And that's, that's where I think the gig economy or the new, new age uh, ideas could really come, uh, come, come take us up to par with the, with the more developed world. You know, I, I spoke about self-help groups and Fisher Women, but I don't know how many of us are even aware that the best electric motor vehicles in India, uh, the best electric bikes in India are made by a women entrepreneur in Coimbatore. That's Ampere. Uh, it's, it's a woman entrepreneur who makes the best electric bikes in India. Uh, you know, when the tsunami flood hit Tamil Nadu, uh, you know, the government failed uh, to locate people who were distressed and to provide food uh, packets. It was a women entrepreneur who runs a social innovation called Social Cops who assisted the government of Tamil Nadu in reaching out to these people. And the first uh, unicorn right now in e-commerce, social, uh, you know, uh, 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 shop clues is led by a woman here. So, uh, I mean, or look at uh, the great success story of Google, of Internet Sathis. It's all a story of women in the field level. I mean, it's a remarkable story of what the Western world has failed, has succeeded in India. And it's all about internet satis in rural areas. Yeah. I want to take a second question, which is uh, how do you address societal biases, right? I, I think one good way, you know, it's all about fear of the unknown. You know, when I came to India two years ago, I had a very big bias about how the place was going to be. And when I came here, I felt much more comfortable. You know, first of all, I felt like a majority the first time in my life, which was very good, right? But I think also, as business people, as government, we can take on some biases, right? So there is a bias around when a girl menstruates, she's unclean, and she shouldn't go in the kitchen. So we came with a movement called Touch the Pickle, which was by a whisper brand, and it started a discussion about menstruation is a completely normal bodily function. Without it, none of us would be alive, all right? Then for our laundry brands, we came with Share the Lord. So as both husband and wife are working, the husband can't become the same lazy person who sits there and gets everything solved to them. They have to do share the Lord, right? We have something called It Takes Two for a Pampers brand, which is like, as you're raising a child, right, and both of you are working, I better change my share of diapers, right? Okay. 
And we've got something called Being Girl, which is our Whisper brand again. You know, they really went alive at the Olympics, which is letting girls really express themselves as girls, participating in sports. And we have such good role models in India, right? With, with the Ritual Olympics, right? So this is, I think, another way of confronting those biases in a way that starts a conversation. And with social media today, the discussion happens. Now, who are we talking to? We're talking to the parents. We're talking to society who holds this bias, right? These young girls and young guys, they are okay. They are moved on, right? But we're trying to address it at the roots, right? And I hope that we can make a difference in a small way with these kind of conversations happening, right? And the government, of course, is supporting us. When Prime Minister Modi declares, you know, that girl child is an important priority for the government, it's sending a message, right? So again, it's, I think, a joint responsibility to confront those biases. But we have to be patient. These things take time, right? And we have to stay with it. It's going to take a while to get there. I think infrastructure, all these policies will always take time. We've got another question here. You can get a mic. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Rekha, a global shaper, and I also work in Patna, Bihar, in the rural areas with men and women farmer and the youth. So my question comes from that area. Uh, as everybody said, and yes, there is a lot of improvement in education system, and girls are outperforming everywhere. So we are seeing a lot of enrollments and uh, with the kind of schemes which is happening for girls, a lot of uh, girls are coming forward. And uh, with those schemes, we are giving them wings and aspirations at rural level, at village question. level and district level. Yeah, I'll just come into that. But after 12th, or at max, after graduation, very few girls are uh, you know, fortunate enough to go to go, uh, graduate schools uh, for graduation in rural areas. So even if they are able to complete, they do not get opportunity to get associated in the workforce of the India. The reason being, we really, really do not have too much of job opportunities at district level or panchayat level. And girls usually do not get opportunity to migrate to other spaces, be it cities or even to other districts. Usually, there is a very small chunk. So how our policies uh, is uh, planning to tackle this problem to uh, give these job opportunities at the district level or at the rural level? Because everybody cannot come to city. So how we are trying to do okay, that? Okay, let, let, let me, let me rephrase that question to kind of ensure that we get viewpoints from all sides. Um, Amitabh, from a government perspective, that's quite important because these women can't move. From a corporate perspective, um, uh, especially, say, for example, banks, tier one, tier two, tier three cities in India, and you're, you're you know, professionally in, in, in manufacturing, um, how do you make this happen? If I can start with you, and then I want to get Pranch's ideas of how can you get everyone on the same page? So I was just analyzing uh, the data for the Mudra loans, which is a self-employment uh, scheme of the government of India. And uh, across the three schemes of Mudra, I was quite amazed to find that 74% of the loans of Mudra have actually flowed to women entrepreneurs. I mean, I was really amazed. Uh, uh, you know, so women entrepreneurs all over India, and it's not about just eastern part of India, it's all over India, are becoming great self-entrepreneurs. Is, is that a government position, government, Amitabh, that, it, that this is now in the rural and the district areas, it now comes down so they, to creating jobs yeah. by doing it yourself, by being an entrepreneur in India? So, in these levels? So there are several schemes of government of India. One is, of course, the mudra loans. Uh, the, all state governments assist and support through the self-help uh, groups, which is a very, very huge movement across states in India. Uh, I, th I think, uh, thirdly, I think the entire emphasis is that it's not just about schooling till the school level. That's the point which was being made that in the skilling programs of the government of India, where we've laid down skill qualifications, women become a very integral part of the skilling movement in India so that they become adequately skilled for a vast number of jobs to be able to get good quality jobs in India. And it's not a problem of unemployment, it's a problem of uh, low paid jobs. And how do we skill it and get, enable them to get higher paid jobs? I went to this uh, Centurion uh, Skill Institute in Bhuvneshwar, and I was really amazed. You know, Cafe Coffee Day, uh, 
Centurion Institute was training about over 150 girls. So I asked them, well, you've trained them. What, what, what happens to them? And they were all being trained on coffee machines, serving, all soft skills. And he says, all of them are hired by Cafe Coffee Day. So you, what I'm finding is that skilling, their linkage to institutions and to companies is getting very well dovetailed, as would be happening with Procter & Gamble, as would be happening in many other things. But you know, when uh, this big disruption happened in India of demonetization, we were pushing for digital payment. And, uh, one of the great things in India is that everybody has a biometric. Unlike the Western world, 99.9% .9 has biometric in India. Wherever we succeeded in digital payment, uh, look at Krishna and Godavari district of Andhra, or you look at Jharkhand with the tribal women, the acceptability of digital technology was much quicker, much faster in women rather than men. And it succeeded in Krishna and Godavari district where women went to buy ration, were also doing cash in, cash out uh, with the local ration card dealer who was also the banking correspondent. is much quicker. Women's ability to accept technology is much quicker, much faster. Than the, probably, it, it, the question then comes up in manufacturing then, how do you, what kind of gains did you see as a company and how do you translate it and trickle it down to the rural and the district area, um, regions and create the jobs? Because there seems to be a demand supply mismatch then. You know, there, um, I think for us, uh, we have done skill deployment. I mean, today I, I, I'd say we train around 10,000 youth every year. Uh, and uh, they, they get absorbed in our, uh, in our organization. And I think that's where it starts from. And also online training, if you have the, in, in, you know, we have this uh, online uh, IGNU. IGNU is a kind of a scheme which, which is uh, there, which actually enables you to graduate and you don't need to go to school for that. I think that becomes a very important aspect. And um, I think for me, I think for us as an organization, skilling has been very, very important at all levels, which actually we, uh, we took it on, not only at the grassroots level, but also the middle level. Did you actually see an impact on your bottom line when you put these, uh, these processes in place? It did, because I'll tell you why. Because when we talk about textiles, there's a lot of attrition that happens. If you start skilling people, I mean, for, extent, uh, for, for, for example, weaving. Weaving, if you don't have the right skill, you, your efficiencies drop. And if that drops, it impacts the bottom line. Cut and sew, again. So I think if you train them well uh, and, they, they, and you give them the infrastructure that is required in the terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, their children, their education, their nourishment, I think that really ha has a lot of impact to the bottom line. Anisha, I know we only have a few minutes left, so give me an idea of what you think needs to be done ASAP, not just at um, the grassroots level, but at the very height of um, high-tech, high-education services to get women in India back into the workplace and not be the anomaly that you know, all of the headlines in the Western world like to shout about. So I think, you know, if you look at financial services, tech industries, et cetera, again, financial services probably, as I said, at the top end, there are good numbers, but at the mid-level, e-commerce, technology, the numbers are really shabby. And I think one is the points that the government has to do, and Amitabh sort of articulated that very well. But I think the patriarchal mindset is where we are really struggling. And that, too, I think is somewhere where government needs to, sh you know, you know, Beti Bachao is a great way, etc. A lot more of those programs need to do because really I think where we are struggling today is in the mindsets at home, which is that, you know, the woman is just an income enhancer, the job is just good to get your good spouse and, you know, and once you get the spouse and that's it, move on. You need more people like Dipali to come and run businesses and become role models. It was to the point of how do you appeal to the unconscious mind. I can't tell you the number of people who come and tell me that, you know, it's so good to see you working. If my daughter can become like you, it'll be great. And of course, my daughter rolls eyeballs at that, but you know, <laughs> the fact is that you need to build more ownership in the success of a woman at every level, whether it's rural India or uh, urban India. And I think as the mindsets change, uh, you know, you, you'll see more success. Five-year plan or, let's say, three-year plan or a two-year plan of what can be achieved when it comes to the points that everyone's brought up about infrastructure, provide the security, can anything be done in the near term? And what can be done in the medium to long term that can be held up as an example for the West by the government? Number one, focus very, very strongly on nutrition. That's the biggest cause of this all. You can't afford, you know, you've, you've created an intergeneration cycle of deprivation. You need to focus on nutrition. That's the key. Number two, focus on dropout girls out of school. Ensure, and this requires a lot of hand-holding, 
this is the key role of both the government and the private sector to ensure that uh, we are able to ensure that girl students complete their schooling. Number three, skill them. And number four, for the mothers, stop pampering boy kids. The mothers are spoiling India by pampering boys. Don't tell my husband yeah. that. Yeah. But um, Pranchu, from your perspective, immediate needs that can address this gap and what needs to be done in the medium term to long term? What can be done immediately to address this gap is the toughest and also the easiest. The change is to start with each one of us. The government can provide this much, corporations can do this much. We are a very diverse co uh, country with its peculiar set of challenges. We may not be able to go everywhere to maybe invest into factories so we can provide employment. We ensure that there are women leaders like Dipali who ensure that there should be enough. That's going to happen in the middle to long to an extra long time. In the shortest period of time, if we can just flick the switch in our minds and become a little bit more rational, a little bit more logical, and understand that, look, it really makes sense to ensure that the kids, whether they're boys or girls, are exactly the same. And that's a massive radical shift that we need happening. In, in, in our society. If that happens, you know, make a percentage point movement on that and alongside the basics like nutrition, we are pretty much on our way. The biggest gap currently lies in our minds, in our minds alone. Al, lessons that BNG or the rest of the world can learn from things and actions that are being uh, done here in India, does something strike you that uh, aha moment, that this is a lesson we can take? It's not always west to east. I think, look, there are many, many things today going from India to the Western world, right? A lot of innovation is coming here. I talked to you about a few of the campaigns we've run here, right? And these are winning awards in Cannes, right? And they get replicated globally, right? So, so I, I think we can be an example, okay? I would say today that there's no place better to be than in India. Macroeconomically, demographically, with the policies the governments are coming in, if we can get this piece right and really empower women and get them into the workforce, it's going to take a good thing and make it great, right? And this will be lasting. And it'll be a societal change that we can all look back at and feel very proud about, right? So there will be, I think, you know, you're right. You know, we have to start with ourselves. And if we can do it right, I, I think it's going to be wonderful. Dipali, what would you like to see as a final word for this panel? What would you like to see this government do um, in terms of policies, uh, parental leave, maternity leave, infrastructure, and what do you think your company, for example, or companies that you associate with can teach um, Europe or the US? You know what? Um I think government has now set a platform for us, and I, I would not say that they haven't done enough. I mean, with the new policies they've taken on, and I think uh, with Mudra and you know, we you have Stand Up India, Startup India. I think these are the initiatives. I think and they'll take you know time to evolve, and I think those are the examples actually we can take to Europe definitely. But from the perspective as an organization, as as a corporate, I think. We, again, I would just say that we are the people who will have to be responsible for this change. We are the people who can really make that impact because of the kind of employment that we generate. So from, uh, you know, from skill development that we can take on, gender diversity, social inclusion, I think um, these are the initiatives that I would say that from our end we should be taking forward. Uh, government is setting up a platform and I think we have to work as partners clearly to take it forward. Partnership seems to be the key no matter where I go in the world and talk about women, whether they're most powerful or the ones that want to be empowered. Uh, my thanks to this panel. I'm unfortunately unable to take any more questions because we have to wrap it up. But it sounds almost like this is a path that everyone in the world is taking, especially for half the population of the planet. And I am so glad we were able to have this conversation. There are lessons to be learned here. And I think the top and the bottom line of not just the country, but banks, manufacturing, consumer goods, I think it all depends on HR policies and HR solutions. So thank you all very much for joining me. A big round of applause, I think, to this wonderful panel. Thank you.